Tanya Levy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Julie. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am well. I got my fan on. It's warm in my apartment. It's a good place to be. Maybe a little too warm, but I'm not in the snow. Yeah, this is, uh, you're also in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. So uh, we have seen a few snowy days of, as of late, uh, which has been very interesting. A little early for, for the past few years anyways. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we were supposed to be on video, but we've been having technical difficulties. So for those of you who um, watch or listen to the, the, to the show on YouTube, we're going to have the, the old style show for this um, last podcast of the year. Uh, the reason I invited Tanya on the program is uh, it's interesting because there are different reasons. For one, we know each other. And I really felt like at the end of the year, at the end of this season, I wanted to have people that I knew on the show. Um, and that you have something that's very interesting in terms of your your career, in terms of the fact that you're also an artist who has been working a full-time job all along uh, that's not related to the arts. That's right. So, yeah, I really wanted to kind of have somebody that's relatable to me. It, it's a different kind of interview experience because I'm in a different state of relaxation, I suppose. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I feel uh, I, I feel that there's um, oh, a good theater term we love to use, complicite between us, uh, you know, yes. just with shared experience. Right. So, so let's get started with that first then. Um, because so you're a, um, let me just tell everybody who you are. You're a contact center manager with the government of Canada. So in other words, you're a public servant. That's correct. And you're also a theater artist. And we met uh, through the theater, not through the public service. I've never been a public service employee. And so I found that very unique because, you know, in a way, People see us as people who are divided, as though we don't have our full attention on one or the other. Um, how how would you feel about that description? Uh, I definitely think that there's uh, there's always a challenge for um, artists in the office. I think there's a lot of us, and uh, there's always that push and pull about where do we carve off time for our creative pursuits without pulling too much focus away from jobs that we have that, you know, uh, obviously pay the bills. Um, but also, you know, there are many of us who also enjoy the additional career that we have. And and I'm definitely one of those people. Obviously, as a public servant, all opinions are my own. Um, but uh, but I, I love, we'll call it my day job equally as I, I love my art career. Um, I really find value in both. And the the interesting thing for me is that they both inform each other as well. Right. Makes sense. Now, I've taken flack, interestingly enough, from the corporate world, saying I wasn't focused enough in, in, in the corporate stuff. And then I've taken flack from the arts, where they'd be like, oh, well, you're not real, like a real artist. Like, and, and also a lot of visual arts grants, you, you can't get them if you have a full-time job or even in some cases a part-time job. Have you experienced any flack at all from the arts community or otherwise? Um, so this is really interesting. I actually, if I'm going to say I experienced flack, um, I have been on the receiving end of comments that because I have a full-time career outside of the arts that uh, I shouldn't be considering myself a professional artist. Now, uh, for theater, which is a, the, the granting um, schemes are maybe a bit different from visual arts, but uh, under theater grants, I am eligible still to apply uh, because I have advanced training in the, in the field. So I, in, in being theater, I do have a degree in theater. Uh, but there are, there's also, there's always a little piece of me that feels that I also don't want to take funds away from artists who are doing this full time. So there are moments in the past where I have had people say that you know, when you have a career and you're not doing this full time, um, you're not really a professional. They didn't say it in that direct a way, but that was definitely the subtext of it. And I think the the interesting twist is I've taken significantly less flack for it from my career in the public service, where there, uh, I, my experience has been 
Um, and and I, I am lucky, so I, I definitely would add the caveat, your mileage may vary depending on your organization that you work for and, um, you know, what kind of priorities are, are put on your plate, how much overtime you're required to do as part of the work. I've been very lucky and had very supportive um, directors and managers in that regard. So I haven't really had to curb it too much. But that said, you know, I mean, I do have to take um, my time that I'm allotted in terms of vacation or or leave. And if I want to do anything related to the arts, I have to be very, very judicious with that, make sure that I can get the time off. And once that time has been spent, and I have no vacation left. <laughs> um, it's never really so come do down you to find... that. I'm lucky, but that's 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 sometimes right. a reality that can occur. You have to use your you have to use your leave to do it. So I guess I could I could in one, on one hand dispel the myth that we can just you know as public servants perhaps we're given these these lots and lots of flexibility in that regard. But we have we have leave balances and leave banks just the same as a, a lot of people do. So we have to be we have to be careful when, how, and how we manage our time. That uh, the public service is pretty amenable to artists in general. I I've not heard of people expressing that they had significant difficulty in doing it. I mean, they do have to seek, like I said, accommodations to be able to take the time off to do it and to make sure that that fits. And it can limit the um, the number of times, for example, in any given year that you can do something. Um, so usually it does put like a bit of a time crunch on you that if you're a professional working in the arts and with your, um, with the leave that you have, you may just mean you get to do one project. So pick well. Right. That's true. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of artists end up in jobs where they, they are waiters or they work night shift somewhere or, or they work, you know, um, jobs like Uber you know, where they can kind of like make their schedules more f flexible in a way. But I would also think, though, as someone who's worked in the corporate world, in, in private industry, it's even harder for, for people in the corporate world because you have less vacation time, you have less leave, you have. So I would imagine public service would be a great spot for people who want to uh, really focus on very specific projects um, and I, I have a question of curiosity because, again, I've never worked for public service. Can you, like, modify your work hours? Like, modifying work hours is something, at least in the government of Canada, I mean, and, and anybody can really take a look at this. This is available on the on the website, so I'm not saying anything that's um, necessarily... Right. No, we want to make sure. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm, yeah. I've, I've got, I've got like, a, a three-second delay in my own head right now as I'm speaking. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, on, yeah. I'm, I'm on message. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, you can see collective agreements, so you can see what kind of... Um, uh, what kind of adjustments could be there. But we, I, I would assume, likely similar to the private sector. I mean, it is still um, manager discretion. So it's not necessarily a case that if I say I want to take five weeks off to do a play, that it's a guarantee that I'm going to be allowed to do that because there could be other considerations that happen. So, um, okay, makes you know, sense. You, there is, there are opportunities and there are ways that you can do that if you have the balances and, uh, and things like that, but it's not, it's not necessarily a given. It does, you have to be able to, it, I mean, I guess I'll say it this way. You can't really have a negative impact on your work um, and, uh, and your team. So those are always taken into consideration. So maybe, maybe there's another myth I'll dispel. It's not like public servants can just be like, hey, I'm out. And then they just leave for weeks. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, so I had a guest on a, a few months ago, uh, Jacqueline Van de Geer, who is also a good friend of mine from Montreal. She uh, expressed um, concern over the demise of the working class artist because a lot of artists, uh, especially in her field, which is the performing um, performing arts, uh, performance artists, uh, tend to be uh, schooled, as in they they have master's degrees or you know advanced degrees or or they're they're not necessarily w working class artists. 
And I would like to get your thoughts on that because we're both what I would consider working class artists. We're both artists with full time jobs. You know, mm-hmm. T.S. Eliot worked in the Postal Service, I believe. Uh, it, it, it was quite common for the great artists in the past to be working artists. And now it's not. It's, it's quite um, changed. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. So in terms of working class, I, I definitely I definitely hear what you're saying. And, and I, I do I do agree that it is becoming a little bit more challenging, perhaps, for working class artists. And especially, I'll say, even like working class pe- people um, who are from real working class backgrounds, not just broadly middle class or upper middle class, real working class. Um, I mean, in fact, I was reading goodness, this would probably go back, I think, a couple of years. But I remember reading an article before he passed where Alan Rickman was talking about in Britain how the theater school system was eroding opportunities for working class Britons to get into the performing arts. Like he grew up working class and there were other other actors of his generation who were able to make it in. But now with the big focus on theater schools and academies um it makes it difficult and challenging for people who aren't um you know as their families aren't middle to upper middle class and can afford to send them to these schools that you you know you'd have to rely on can i get a scholarship and um you know that can that can have have hinder you i guess in in a sense for well, I guess you could say working artists like myself, where I have a secondary career, um, is it, it does make it challenging in, in, in how often I can create, how often I can participate. And I have seen a reduction in the amount of work I've done certainly over the years. Now I'm not pining for that necessarily because i'm sure we'll cover off on how it's not all doom and gloom from my from my point of view but i mean it has had an impact i can't do anywhere near as much as i was able to when i was in my early 20s and in school and just out of school i was able to do a lot more at that time but um i can't these days and there there i guess you do risk a lack of diversity in voices and I mean, that's that's even apart from everything else related to diversity of voices. This is just in terms of people um, and, and their and their status of whether they are able to work full time in the arts or not. So there's a there's a whole bunch of intersections that I think are probably well beyond the scope of of what we'll cover today, but exist nonetheless. And I think this is one well, of the- and yeah, the, one of the reasons I'm asking a public service worker about this is also because I think there are voices that or plays stories that could be told about the public service. Um, I'm thinking of one told by a Quebec filmmaker. I I think the Quebec, uh, sorry, I think the English translation is Days of Darkness, but it's hilarious because it's really, really spoof. There's been a lot of Quebec films about the public service, you know, um, in one of them, in um, Invasion Barbare, barbarian invasions where they 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 compare the unions to like the mafia you know just things is kind of like poking at at certain things which i found really fascinating and i've I've always wondered if the writers had experience in public service or experience with unions or whatever and so i'm always curious to see you know how many if, if if um if working in an environment like the public service informs your your storytelling as a theater writer because you do write plays so this is something that I haven't told the audience yet, but you're your director and and you're a writer. And and I'm so I'm curious to know if your work in public service has influenced um, the writing of your stories. And if sometimes you kind of insert the things, maybe critiques about the, the public service or maybe things that you love about the public service into your stories or if it's completely separate. Um, so I haven't written directly about the public service itself, though I know that, um, you know, again, I think going back to about 2016, there was a, in English, there was a show called, uh, a a play called The Public Servant, which uh, was at the Great Canadian Theatre Company. And that was written by non-public servants, but informed by public servants. So the the company that created this play um, went and, and, and spoke with public servants, and it was specifically the female public service experience. So it was all women as well. 
Uh, oh, wow. And I remember, I remember them putting the call out, hey, if you're a female public servant, we'd love to talk to you about your experience. I didn't, I didn't sign up for, for that. I was like, oh no, I'll leave it to someone who doesn't have a theater background because, you know, they'll probably have something more informative to say than me putting my theater spin on it regardless. Um, but in my own work, how I've seen that reflect, I would say is, uh, Sir, like I've gained a lot of different skills, especially. So I, I mentioned I, I work in a contact center and now I'm a manager of the, the contact center. And uh, I definitely work for an organization that um, is a, definitely more, we'll, we'll say, on the analytical spectrum of things. So the, the type of work that's done where, uh, where I am definitely looks at a lot of analysis. And I think that that skill set is one that I've developed a lot more since I've been working um, in the public service. And I'm, I'm just, I think, uh, heading into my 12th year um, in the public service. And where I already felt a really good strength in terms of writing with um, emotion and creativity, there was that kind of lack of analytical rigor that I was applying to my work that now I feel I can and I can empathize even better with characters that I might write who want to reflect more on a situation and I can add more nuance um, to the work that I do from that from that analytical perspective looking at how systems impact people so I think while I'm not writing directly about the public service because I know the structure of how that works and how systems are such a big thing and following systems and knowing how to operate within systems, that that is what informs my work for a, a play that I'm currently working on about um, uh, a riot that happened in Toronto in 1933, which was um, basically ended up being a, a very large um, riot in where a, a, a Christian baseball team and a Jewish baseball team had, there were thousands of people who took part in this. So the Christie Pitt riot in 1933, um, I'm able to apply that analytical lens and looking at systems in a way I wasn't able to before I started working um, in government. Yeah, I, I can I can totally see that. I think in my brain, it's interesting because what it as a photographer, especially uh, and especially when I worked as a photographer in Montreal, um, I as my as my job grew in the corporate world, I found that I was able to structure my shoots much better. Mm -hmm. Everything was, you know, more structured. Everything was more on time. Um, you know, it, it, it allows you to. Um, I was joking. It was, it was a friend of mine, Sandra Nafon, and we were saying like creativity thrives in a in a in a box in a in a framework. And I think the more you have frameworks, the more you can structure things, the better, the more creative you end up being, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the better a better artist in 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 the end. Yeah, it feels, um, it feels completely counterintuitive, but I one hundred percent agree with you that creativity does benefit from parameters because then you can have the fun in figuring out where the walls are and when you're bumping up against the walls and which wall can move, but which wall is very solid and you can't really push against it too hard. Um, I want to, I want to pivot a little bit here into the work that you do mm -hmm. because you and I have nerded out on a lot of concepts uh, because the work that you do is, is stuff that's applicable in technology as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know, I'm a tech consultant. Primarily, I also t uh, consult in marketing and um it really, really touches those areas. And so we've nerded out on everything from UI design to, gosh, I don't know what else, management principles to to whatever. And um, so you've pivoted during COVID because the pandemic, I think, uh, offered a lot of people op opportunities. And perhaps we're not hearing about that side of COVID as much as we are in the news media or on social media. Mm -hmm. But there have been a lot of people that have, you know, really disturbed their lives in the sense that they've kind of shaken things up and really um, changed their careers or learned new skills or uh, decided to study something new in school. So for you, how did the pandemic change the direction of your, your career and your ambitions? Yeah, so I'm, 
I'm really lucky. I had a, a, a an, almost an epiphany this year. So to give a little bit of backstory. So when I was still in theater school and working, um, I'm also, as you mentioned, I live in Ottawa. I had both my parents were public servants. So from a very young age, being bilingual was a really, really big, important thing in my household because they, my parents wanted um, my brother and I to have the best opportunities possible. So we were in French immersion from the get-go. So I've always spoken French. I've spoken French since I was about four years old. And uh, as, I, as I went to university, I found some opportunities. Um, first, I worked at one of the national museums here. And through that, uh, at being a tour guide, I was able to start working in their call center. And I had shifts where um, when I wasn't in the museum giving, giving guided tours or helping people at the front desk, I'd actually be in the contact center helping people figure out which, you know, exhibits they wanted to see and things like that. And that's where I basically got my start in contact centers. And being bilingual, it makes it very, very, um, it's much easier. I'll put it that way. It's much easier to find contact center work in, in, in Ottawa when you're bilingual. So uh, I used to joke with people that I basically made a career out of being bilingual and working yeah. um, working call center jobs. It was just really simple and straightforward. They pay generally pretty well and uh, gave me flexibility to adjust my schedule at the time when I was able to do more uh, artist artistic work. And so I sort of parlayed that and worked in a number of different contact centers and eventually found my way into the contact center I'm in now. And, uh, you know, spent many years, like I said, I've been in the public service now for almost getting close to 12 years. And that's always been in this one unit. And I worked from a, a, an, an officer taking calls through to quality assurance. And now I'm the manager. And since the beginning. Sorry, of the Tanya, can I yeah. interrupt you for a second here? I want to tell people what a contact, a contact center does. Oh, just sure. really quickly. Yeah. Uh, just like two minutes. Sure. Um, tell us what it does. So a contact center is basically a call center, uh, but uh, not necessarily your typical call center. Uh, we, at, in my uh, unit, in my work group, we actually deal a lot more in information. So we provide information to the general public. So where you might think of a call center as being um, entirely service oriented in terms of doing transactions, contact centers are not exclusively um, transactions like financial transactions or or things like that so you can deal in a, in a number of different i guess service channels we can call them which segues well because this is like the um, yeah this is the canadian citizens essentially um Correct. contact with the government this is yeah. really your like the first line of contact with the government that's right that's right so my my career in government has literally been spent speaking with canadians on a daily basis um, which is really rewarding. And um, there's a lot of people who really do care about that work. It's, it's full of people who really believe in being a public servant and really want to help Canadians and want to help the public. So I hope that any citizen who's listening to this, certainly in Canada, would be um, would take that uh, as, a, as a compliment. We, 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 we do care. And we want to serve. Um, so this whole concept of service is actually something that um, um, is very big now, not just in government. It's also really, really big in the private sector is looking at um, service design, user experience design, which you mentioned we, we really geeked out on a lot. And I saw more and more opportunities of, of this concept of design thinking. And I got really interested in it because it's a creative way to look at, in my case, how can, can we improve service? What can we look at in, in terms of how we offer service and um, making things efficient for citizens, for the employees who take the calls, for the departments that we serve? Um, just thinking about things and, and taking the time to look at problems in new ways. And I learned this year about the field of design thinking more generally, and in particular, user experience um, and service design itself. And I was able to complete a certification in user experience research, which was really great. And I got to learn a lot about 
um, analyzing what users need, what people actually need and what they're looking for when they interact and how to get that feedback from them so that you can create new solutions that might work even better. And Tony, right. I, I'm yeah. sorry, sorry, go ahead. sorry to interrupt again, but um, user experience, when you're talking about users, are you talking about your internal users? Because one of the things you learn in, in corporate Canada and corporate America is that you have like different kinds of users. You have your, your internal users, which are your colleagues, your employees, uh, administrators, et cetera. And then you have your external ones, like the people in your case, which would be calling in, emailing in, whatever, buying your product. Uh, so which ones are you most specialized in? For me, I am currently specialized in, um, I would say I'm, I'm more, I'm more well-versed in the external service with a strong inclination to want to learn more about internal service to him. Gotcha. Okay. So um, the government of Canada is again, doing a lot of great work in this area. I won't go too much into that. Again, people can find this on the internet and um, I don't, necessarily need to be a spokesperson uh for my em employer well, and, and i don't, don't want to turn my clearly yeah yeah and i don't want to turn my podcast into an advertisement for anything or anyone right Unless no, exactly me. so then then i'll totally praise the public service if you want to give me money but yeah, yeah. um <laughs> no exactly not but, a yeah, sponsor. Uh, not a sponsor <laughs> right exactly exactly but, uh but let's talk about uh, um and and uh, did you want to finish or, or yeah I so i was i was just gonna uh, continue so i was um yeah, I want to build on this. And I've I've found so many resources for design thinking. And since then, I've also done a certification in change management, which a lot of people have no idea what kind of thing that is. But um, the easiest way to describe it is when you manage a project, when you're managing the thing that is the project and setting up, how are we going to launch this? And what are we going to do to get uh, this particular, for example, software going or used? Change management is a component of that where rather than looking at the business side of things in terms of, you know, finance and the IT services and policies and procedures, you're actually looking at um, the human side of change management. So how do you help people through change? And that dovetailed incredibly well with everything I'd done with design thinking. And the thing that was most mind blowing for me was how similar design thinking was to all the skills I gained when I was doing my theater degree. The tools are so similar from um, drawing out grids and using whiteboards and post-its to determine different segments of how you can think about uh, getting people engaged in in different projects and how to approach them to figure out what they need and help guide them. Um, that uh, doing a customer journey map is almost like doing a plot synopsis and analysis of a play. It follows almost the same method. And I was just so completely blown away at how all of a sudden my art skills that I thought would never be relevant became incredibly relevant to the work I was doing. Yeah, I um, I recently spoke with a mutual friend of ours, and she was also she's also a theater artist, and and she's now a VP of operations, and she was um, you know, uh, expressing pretty much what you just said, which is that it, it's it's almost like designing a play or dis or writing something, or planning you know, um, I don't know, an event is very similar to change management or designing a new product or whatever. So there's so many what what the the industry calls um transferable skills mm -hmm. and there are so many artists out there that are going through a rut and they don't think that their skills are worth something on the market and i'm always telling them you can actually take all the knowledge and all the skills that you have in writing a play or directing a film into the private sector or into the public service like 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 you've done um so i think that's important for artists to remember uh, 100%. And, and vice versa and vice versa because i know a lot of scientists and i've interviewed a few and the ones who are listening to the show know who they are who want to do artistic projects and i'm always like hey guess what it's almost the same thing you're managing a project yeah you know? absolutely one of the one of the greatest <laughs> actors i ever had the pleasure of working with um their original degree was in, I think, metallurgical engineering, and they were the most phenomenal wow. actor, and they were able to 
bring those skills from that engineering background to be able to look at and and really identify when they would analyze their character and plots and, and prep do all their prep for the for the show that that mindset that analytical mindset really helped them in terms of being able to find what they needed and um i mean i think there's so much benefit to you know if you feel like you're more of an analytical person embrace some creativity you'll surprise yourself equally as i would say if you think you're a completely creative person and you're like oh no business not me like no 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 you probably have excellent analytical skills that you've developed but just don't see them as being analytical skills because they're in this little veneer of being creative only yeah exactly there's this kind of like all or nothing mentality kind of gets in the way, in my opinion, of people's success. Um, let's talk about external users. I uh, I listened to, I've been on a kick late, lately. I've been watching MIT lectures. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed that MIT did this for free. They've got these this open courseware, guys. If, if you're not familiar with it, go to YouTube, type in MIT open courseware, and you've got a bunch of free MIT lectures. I'm pretty sure the other American universities have caught up and have started offering that as well. Uh, but I watched one the other night on marketing because I was curious to see what they offered in terms of marketing courses, sales. I'm, I'm always open to new perspectives on things. Um, and there was one case study where the guy, he's a serial entrepreneur in the United States, uh, ex extremely successful millionaire. Because the, the other thing about, that I love about MIT is that they don't get just anyone to do their lectures. They get like the best of the best. Anyway, this guy was telling a story about how um, he worked in the nutrition business, um, medical, I guess, medical nutrition. He invented a, um, like a power bar before power bar was invented, you know, mm -hmm. and they were designing this for people on dialysis because what they learned is that people on dialysis can't drink as much water as um, a healthy person. They are often uh, malnourished. And they thought that it would be highly successful because they interviewed all of these medical doctors that said, hey, this is a great idea. You should market this. You should produce this. You should sell it to our patients. So great. Um, went to market. And all of a sudden, this, they didn't get the sales they wanted. You know why, Tanya? Because they didn't talk to the people who would eat the bar. Mm -hmm. They forgot to research with the end user. Um, it, and they learned that the, uh, the people who are on dialysis have different um, perception of taste, as in things that are high protein don't taste the same way that they taste to perhaps you and I, for example. So it was a big lesson for this, you know, marketing expert that, you know what, you've got to talk not just to the people who are paying the bills, but to the end user, to the people who are going to experience the product. And I think as a marketing professional myself, Probably the biggest frustration that I see uh, from personal experience and also in the industry with my colleagues is that CEOs don't listen to us. Oftentimes, they don't listen. They don't listen. They don't think the end users are as important as the people who are paying the bills, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you convince the higher ups that the end users matter? Sometimes legislation can help, not not to be right. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess police service is different, but in general, in general, if you were if you were managing, you know, user yeah. experience for a large organization, mm -hmm. what technique would you use to to convince people that this matters? So there's a lot of there's a lot of research that has been done on showing the benefits of user experience research. Um, it doesn't. It's not actually that hard to find it, and and I encourage your listeners to to go take a look. You will find so much stuff. That's why I'm being a bit, um, I'm not pointing anybody to any particular resource. There's actually there's a lot out there, but not everybody's familiar with the fact that this um, field in in the course that I took in in user experience research, um, which is um, uh, run out of a, a company in Toronto, and the person who runs it has been doing this for a long time. Uh, really sort of opened my eyes to the fact that user research and user design has been a thing for at least 20 years. So it's not actually that new. It's just people weren't really aware of it. And 
maybe in terms of the private sector, again, you know, caveat being I haven't really worked in the private sector. I'm pretty much public sector only. But how perhaps it's more challenging to show real ROI in terms of user experience research. Like, um, you know, I mean, it, you you do risk that if you do it, you'll hear that what solutions you're proposing aren't really what people would hope for. And then that may put you back to square one and maybe not everybody's in a position that they want to hear that. But I think everybody should be in a position that they do go seek it out and seek, you know, in design, you should always design with the user in mind. And beyond just having them in mind, the best way to make sure you're developing a product they can use or a service they can use is to just go ask them. And people are pretty happy to tell you what they, what they think um, they need and how they can, uh, how they can use it. And that's, Re feedback is super important and I know that feedback and I'm seeing it just broadly whether it's public or private sector feedback is becoming a thing that I think more businesses are realizing we have to go and solicit this so that we can help um, the people who are our customers or our users we're going to have a better outcome they're going to have a better outcome really at the end it's win-win so why don't we invest in this and 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 you can show that to um to leaders, the other, the other thing is that people also. Sorry, I I want to comment, but try try to hold on to the next thought, thought you want to go with. But I want to comment on your first one, which yeah. I think you nailed the you you really nailed it because I think um a lot a lot of times stakeholders and leadership tend to want to just um, assume they want to make assumptions they want to design fast they want to get to market fast in private industry in, mm -hmm. in the public sector I would assume that a lot of leaders um, they like having the credit perhaps for their ideas and so having to go out and do market research or user research in your case um, doesn't really give anybody the credit for the ideas right except for the, the perhaps the person who's proposing that mm -hmm. um, and what I usually argue, for leaders is, you know what, use your gut to make good decisions, but don't use your gut to get good data or to, yeah. to make designs. That's not the right place to do a good gut call, you know, no. um, go get the data. And so I think you, you've nailed it on the head. So um, I just wanted to comment on that. And yeah, please. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's, uh, it's all part of that evidence based decision making that we all hear more and more about. And it applies equally to the private sector as it does to the public sector. You need to make decisions based on what data you've been able to glean and our experience. And even, even the most empathetic person may not necessarily grasp what a user really needs or what a client really needs. You have to, you have to hear from them. And you want to lead with that empathy saying, well, I am empathetic. And I'm, in fact, I'm so empathetic that I'm going to ask you to tell me what it is, how, how you're interacting with it, what your needs are, where you're looking for improvements. And in terms of, of, of going to leadership, the other thing is usually like, I mean, people are in the fields they are because they like them. At least that's what I that's what I go into every meeting is like, these people want to be here. This is the job they want to do. I'll give everybody the benefit of the doubt that they're, they're doing the career that's of interest to them, at least in some way. So you're dealing with a, an audience that really is a captive audience. They want to do better at what they're doing. And if you can show them in an empathetic way that, you know, I know this is where you want to be. Right now we're here and here's how we can get to where we're aiming usually leaders are are open to listening and i think if the leader isn't open to listening that's a whole probably a whole other podcast about that <laughs> totally. but uh yeah. but but um uh, again i mean there's a lot of leaders out there and again i can only speak to my own experience but i'm seeing more and more openness for this which is a great thing it's an amazing thing government is obviously a bit different than private sector because you know we are funded by Canadians, so we have to be careful with how um, that money is is managed. That's one of our main tenets of, of of being a public servant is to have that responsibility. So, you know, you may find government may be aiming a bit more towards the getting it really right. Let's really do it right, so things end up taking a bit longer. Yeah. Um, the, well, if, the agility it's not just of the that it's private sector. Yeah, it's not just that, but, um, and I can say this because I don't work for the public service, but in general, public service websites suck. 
Um, and I think that the I'm really happy actually to hear that there is a, an incentive and and, and and a, a kind of a focus on user experience because I think that that's really uh, the best way to make them not suck. It's to it's to actually do the user experience research and and in the end, it really I think the um, it's important because especially when you're looking at things like healthcare, um, you know, EI um, for Americans uh, that's our employment insurance. It's where you know the unemployed can get checks from the government and and, and social supports from the government. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are all the, the the big ones that I can think of off the top of my head where you want a really well designed platform um, to, to enable users to access the services that they need. So I'm really happy to hear that that's a priority. Um, I'm always still going to criticize it because as an end user, <laughs> boy, there are some government websites out there, um, you know, and I'm not targeting any government. I'm just saying in general, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, government is known for moving slower. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, I would hope, I would hope and I don't know, maybe I can ask you this question is, is there, um, and maybe you can't answer it, but iteration, you mm -hmm. know, like agile methodology, we see that a lot in private industry. Yes. What, what would be the reason why the public service wouldn't be able to adapt a model like that? Uh, actually, the public service is, is really well versed in agile. That's a really big thing in public okay. service right now is agile development. Um, so it's definitely a place where we are. and and. Just to touch on on looking at how government and again Canadian the government of Canada, um, you can even look up the Canadian Digital Service, which is an organization that's helped to look at how government service is delivered. So this is this is actually a really big thing right now in Canada that's uh, uh, that really is being looked at. So it's it's a great time I think to be in service design in Canada and in the Canadian government as well. It's a great time. And you see it across provinces and territories. This is a thing now. So if anybody out there is yeah. looking for a career path, I suggest you look into this one. It's, a, it's, it's, totally it's, a, it's it. an interesting intersection of creativity and analytics. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm hearing this in the, in the U.S. I'm hearing this from even in Europe. I'm, he I'm hearing a lot of my European colleagues saying, oh, there, this is happening. Mm -hmm. Like, this is really happening, whether it's the EU or in the UK. Um, service design, can we quickly, because we're, we're kind of running out of time, which sure. sucks, because I wish I could just go on and on with you, but service design, yeah. is that just what it sounds like? Is it, a, is it like a, what do they call those, buzzword? Or is it really just the design of services? It's de it is the it is the design of services. There's uh it's 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 a really big field. Um, I encourage anyone who has any remote interest in this, if you have LinkedIn or some other type of social media platform like that, and type service design in it, you will get so much information from it. Uh, it really is a thing. So people are looking at how we design services, not just products, but really services. How do you can how do you change a website? to become even more service oriented in the in the in the private sector or the public sector how do we engage with people through services in ways that are intuitive easy to use meet their needs and um you know can meet them in terms of accessibility as well uh this is this is this is massive i i feel like this is a paradigm shift for a lot of people who aren't used to seeing that but it's um it's it's fantastically interesting. Uh, there's lots of stuff being done in Europe. Um, there's so many, so many people looking into this. There are master's degrees programs in this now that I wish I could take, but they're all in person in Europe. So that's not, uh, that's not in the cards for me right now. Um, but yeah, service design, I, like people really are seeing the importance and, and have recognized that we need to take a look at how we're meeting the needs of people who come to us with a challenge that they need help with. So how can we best help them? And um, for me, that's interesting because I've built my career on looking at how can I help people. I've spent my other career listening to how do we tell stories? What stories do we tell about ourselves? And now seeing the intersection of our own story or journey right now to find a solution. So how do I help them navigate that? And that's where I get that link between my background in theater and my new 
skills in design and change management. Tanya, are you seeing any movement there for uh, things like AI and machine learning? Is that something that you've seen in your studies? Yes. Yeah. AI, uh, machine learning are all parts of the puzzle. And there's still going to need to be that human interaction. There's uh, the concept of omni-channel service delivery. What that means is basically offering service through channels that people want to get the service from. So you are, we are, I, I'm seeing a lot of really looking about making digital service more robust so that it's, it's, it's more usable, um, user-friendly, that people can access it, but not to the exclusion of more traditional channels like phone, like going in person, sending a letter, um, sending an email or a web form. All of those are still there. So you, you this whole idea of omni-channel service delivery is uh, is is still very much present and looking at, well, what does the user want? And let's figure it out and iterate, to use that, that beautiful um, agile development term, iterate frequently. Let's think about solutions. Let's keep making adjustments here and there until, you know, we start getting into the phase that we're like, oh, we're really, really created something really useful. And then just keep developing it. It's that whole, really, there, it, it, it really is the journey. It's the service journey, not the service goal. Oh, that's the cheesiest thing I've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> I sound like I'm working. I'm like I'm watching a corporate commercial now. Son. Yeah, I've turned. I've I'm turned into a corporate video. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm totally gonna razz you about that um, because that's one of the things I got to say. Like uh, as we kind of, you know, we have about ten minutes left on the show. But one of the things that really has always annoyed me about corporate life, and one of the reasons actually why I never got interested in, in the public service, is the amount of acronyms, the amount of buzzwords, the amount of fakeness. And that's that's where, uh, as an artist, I struggle a lot working in, in very large organizations. And, and it's one of the reasons why I thrive as a consultant, because I get to come in, and especially because I consult with startups. I love startups because you have that kind of more one-on-one -on -one thing. And so how do you cope? You know, as, as somebody who I, I consider very authentic, uh, we've always been able to speak very openly about stuff. But like, how do you cope? Because there is, there is fakeness. I mean, it's there with any organization, but especially in large organizations. How do you cope with it? So um, one thing, I guess, is that my theater degree really did prepare me to memorize a whole bunch of acronyms. So I already had that inherent <laughs> skill. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I, I will be the first to admit there are a lot of acronyms in government. That's a, that's definitely, um, definitely a thing. Uh, so you just, you do have to have a tolerance for, for, for speaking in those particular ways. And I mean, it, I think it's no, it's not exclusive to, to government having different ways of speaking or that lingo it happens in in private sector especially when you get into management speak with leveraging synergies and um oh God, you know business validating bingo, right yeah the business lingo exactly um but uh i i was just able to adapt i knew it's just it's really i just always just saw it as a tool that you have to be familiar with as you as you move through because sometimes it's easier to say an acronym than a really long committee name and that's just the reality, but um, I think it's it's something that internally, because I'm just going to keep coming back to service because this is really where my my passion is uh, in 2021. Um, again, there's also a really big movement in terms of plain language use, externally certainly and internally even um, is starting to become a thing. But to be able to write just in ways that most people will be able to understand you because even if you work in one government organization, you may not know the lingo of another one that you're a, that is a partner or a stakeholder with you. So it helps to have that plain language context that you can, um, that you can use between them. And I, you know, some people may criticize plain language for being, you know, losing nuance, but I, I personally don't agree with that. I mean, I'm much more happy that the more, the more and greater number of people who can understand what we're doing, whether you're in public or private sector, is always better. Because at the end of the day, we really want them to know what, what we're doing, what we're offering, and how they can interact with us and, and get what they need. 
So um, plain language is 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 massive. It's a really big thing. Plain language the is the shit. It is the shit. Listen, I told you not to get me excited <laughs> when we first started recording. I was like, don't get me excited. I'm going to get too loud on the mic. Plain language is everything. Yeah. It, it is to me, as a marketer especially, right? It is how you communicate so people can understand you. You can have the most complicated words. It doesn't mean you have more nuance. It just means nobody gets what the heck you're saying. Um, and in the end, that's really what matters is, is that, and especially in service design, especially with external end users, because they have varying degrees of education. They have varying cultures. They have varying understandings of what, what, a, what a word, any word means. So I think, you know, <laughs> if I was the public service and I was recruiting for service design positions, I'd be like, we're recruiting theater writers only. Is also, if anybody, again, if anybody's looking at upskilling, who's listening to this podcast, there are courses out there that you can take to help um, learn a little bit more uh, about how to use plain language appropriately in whatever context your work context happens to be. But it's it's incredibly worthwhile. And exactly, I think it, people should be able to understand what they're engaging with really quickly. And the benefit of it is, is if they can quickly grasp what your mandate is, what your corporate values are, what your um, shareholder forecast could be. Here I am using like private sector terms and then thinking I know what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like if you, if you can communicate that in a really clear way, people are going to understand quicker. They may even be able to more effectively use your service, which then, hey, that does have an ROI to it. If they can more effectively use your service and it doesn't take quite as long because they understand right off the bat what what their the, the knowledge that they're going in with and where they need the clarification, then maybe you'll reduce your call times. Maybe you'll reduce your call wait times. Maybe you'll reduce the volume of, of incoming questions you get. Maybe you'll be able to, for private sector, sell your product faster turn over the calls in the help desk quicker. There's so much, so much possibility there. 100%. That's, um, you know, amen to that, Tanya. Um, <laughs> I have like two minutes left. And I want to talk to you about gaming real quick. Yeah. I know that you were, uh, you got into, into gaming pretty much during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a gamer my whole life. And uh, I'm curious to know, how did gaming change the way you think? How did gaming change the way I think? Um, so I went from being a casual telephone match three gamer to now having a gaming laptop that I use to PC game. <laughs> um, it, I think it made me in some ways, and I'll be, I'll just say that I, I play a lot of um, hack and slash games. I'm a big Diablo fan. Um, but uh it makes me think quicker and I have to evaluate things more quickly when I'm playing games. So um, I feel like my brain has been able to adapt a bit more to be able to analyze something really quickly and understand this is where I need to put my attention. So in that way, it's helped me, I guess, um, strengthen my focus in certain ways and be able to um, see the patterns I need to see more quickly. I joked on, uh, do you know Tom Meganson? No, I don't. Oh, he's a, he's a friend of mine here in, uh, in Ottawa. He's a um, content, hmm, how do I describe him? A communicator, I suppose, a content writer. Um, yeah, I guess the, that's his new, I forget what his new uh, title is. But anyway, we were amusing about, um, you know, he was saying that he likes to go out for a walk to work out work problems. Um, and he always kind of, I, I don't know if he feels guilty about it, but he was just, you know, emphasizing the need that, that or the the benefit of going outside for a walk as you work at a problem. And I expressed to him that actually I frequently play a half hour of a Minecraft in order to work out issues. I work out things sometimes visually with blocks in Minecraft. And I'm like, if I destroy this link, what happens here? And if I use this and, and then I, I kind of pause the game or end the game and go back to whatever problem I was working on. Mm -hmm. And so I find it always fascinating when people 
who are not gamers adopt gaming. Mm -hmm. And in your case, you adopted hack and slash, which I find also very interesting. Um, and then apply that to their, their work life, their career, their art life. So I, that's why I asked the question, because I'm always curious. And, um, you know, if you if you like Diablo and, and you find that it's uh, helped you with your focus, I'm curious, have you tried Fortnite? Have you tried keeping up with the kids? I, okay, this is this, crazy. Here's here's my most personal anecdote of the entire um, interview. So I am I am not a fan of um, MMOs. I actually don't okay. like MMOs. I don't like interacting with I, people. Neither do I. And but that's why I'm asking. Okay. I, I like trying things, right? So I'm like, oh, Fortnite is free. Download it. And then I kind of went, Oh my God, I'm getting killed. Yeah. It's, it was craziness. My was my wild. husband my husband is a huge gamer. And just watching him play GTA online, and he has he has uh, he does that with his friends once a week. Okay. Um, he has this nice. He, I let him go. It's great. It's his time. But I've sat and watched them, and uh, that's the first time I ever learned the term griefer. And he had a <laughs> terrible experience with a griefer who didn't like it when he griefed him back. And then went and um, complained to the company and got my husband's account locked and wiped and had to restart it. Oh, yeah. So M MMOs, no, not so much. See, I used to play World of Warcraft, like quite, I, I, I perhaps say I was a little bit addicted to it when I was very, very young. And um, it was, you know, as I grew older, the kids from California would start joining in because of the different server times and, and you know, um, different um time zones that's the word i'm looking for uh so i would play late and the kids from california would jump on and you can you can hear people's voices and stuff and interact with them and and i mean it was just brutal i would get killed by by the kids and i was like you know what i'm i'm not playing this anymore because now i'm not having fun yeah. it's not fun anymore you know when 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 and and you can't blame them because when i was young i was exactly like them you know my reaction speed was super fast had, had there been a fortnight Back when I was like a teenager, I would probably be in esports right now because that was my thing. That was my jam. But I yeah, anyway, it. I believe it. You're 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 <laughs> incredible. I have I have played uh, video games with you on at least one occasion, and I know that you are um, oh, very God. adept. <laughs> I am adept, but I'm not adept at the teenagers today's teenagers no. level. So no. esports and is not a it's not a thing for me now. <laughs> my my nephews are all about like uh fortnite so i don't i'm this is the I'll, I'll draw the line here this is where i'm i'm we'll call it old yeah can't, can't yeah, do it right <laughs> right exactly anyway on that note um tanya it's been a real <laughs> pleasure having you on the show and to have a friend on the show and to uh talk to you about you know we've talked about nerdy stuff but there's things that i still didn't know about you so uh, I appreciate you coming on. And um, to all my listeners, I wish you all a beautiful end of the year. Uh, the show will be back if you're listening to this in December 2021. The show will be back in about six months, taking a break, moving to a different province. It's a long story, but um, I'll probably do, maybe I'll post like an update episode. Anyway, thanks for uh, coming on the show. Thanks for listening, guys.